Good afternoon to everybody. We're starting our traditional uh, webinar of the uh, Forum of the Friends of European Russia. My name is Andres Kubilis. Uh, I am coordinating this forum. And today we have a very important topic uh, on our agenda. Do Western sanctions on Russia war? So uh, I will uh, not be very long in my introduction. Uh, exactly, you know, we remember well when the war started, the uh, European Union uh, was uh, pushing for sanctions. Even for our surprise here in the European Parliament, uh, sanctions were introduced quite, quite uh, quickly with all the different packages, uh, with embargo on oil and gas which was uh, really quite a hot debate in, in here in the parliament. And now after one year of, you know, from one side war continuation, from another side uh, sanctions continuation, uh, we think that it's very important to look more deeply into uh, experience of sanctions, uh, what we managed to achieve, uh, what still is, is needed. And uh, Definitely, no, uh, I would say in a very simple way that sanctions were targeted to achieve two major things, at least in my opinion. One is to diminish uh, uh, Russian uh, budgetary inflows, especially from oil and gas export, uh, in order not to allow uh, you know, Russian war machine to be financed uh, with uh, huge amounts of money. And second, of course, sanctions were introduced not to allow uh, Russian military industry to produce um, uh, you know, modern weaponry with high-tech uh, uh, with high-tech uh, instruments, which Russia usually was importing from the West. What uh, what are the outcome? Of course, uh, last year we have seen that during the year Russian incomes, nevertheless, to the budget were quite high because of the oil and gas prices. But starting from December, from uh, oil price cap, uh, incomes went down very heavily. At least that is what, what we see in the data. And second, of course, uh, perhaps we uh, were able to witness that uh, circumvention of, of export and uh, uh, of goods became quite, uh, quite a problem. And that is what we need to uh, to to look more deeply and to find a way what to do. Uh, so, um, uh, in general, I would say to all those skeptics which are available also here in Brussels who are saying, well, uh, sanctions are, no, are not working and that is why there is no need uh, to, to prolong them. Uh, that is the wrong approach. Really, we see sanctions are working, but I hope that during our webinar, there will be more of evidence and more of data to convince everybody. But second, of course, it's very clear that there are things which we uh, need to improve or need to strengthen those uh, sanction instruments which are working. Without any longer introduction, I am, uh, uh, you know, I will, I will, now start the whole debate uh, discussion in our in our webinar. Uh, but before that, uh, just few uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, each speaker will have uh, uh, from seven to ten minutes uh, to make the initial statement. Uh, questions should be put in a written to uh, chat, and uh, all the seminar will go on uh, English language. We do not have translation today to Russian language. Now, uh, I would uh, give the floor to Vladimir Vilov, Vice President of Free Russia Foundation, really very well known expert. Uh, I will not continue all, all, all the titles, you know, <laughs> which belong to, to Vladimir Milov, but uh, his uh, earlier, he produced one report, uh, which was published on Martin Center website, uh, beyond the headlines, the real impact of Western sanctions on Russia. So. Everybody who is participating in our webinar had a, uh, they got the link also to read that uh, paper. But I know that also other uh, speakers uh, they produced uh, really very important and very interesting reports on the same topic uh, quite recently. 
so we have really uh, good possibility to discuss in uh, in, uh, in uh, depth you know those issues which are really very very important and which have very big geopolitical consequences vladimir please floor is yours thank you very much andres very happy to update uh, colleagues with some of my analysis and thanks for mentioning my uh, publication for the Martin Center, uh, there's a new one coming, uh, which I think is due out of like in a few days or so in the first half of May and updates uh, because there are several important developments that happened since we'll be talking about them as well. But a few important issues before I describe the current situation is that first, uh, I strongly continue to suggest that in the uh, analyzing the efficiency of uh, sanctions against Russia, we really go deep into multiple indicators. We study different sectors, different markets, different parameters. That is a very wrong approach that is frequently used by some of the media and some of the policymakers that we do concentrate uh, on a handful of uh, popular macroeconomic indicators like GDP, unemployment, exchange rate, inflation. That is not reflecting the whole picture and it will be uh, a, a much more, uh, much more uh, important and useful thing if you really do have this large cross-sector look uh, to understand where are the weak points in Putin's economic system, where sanctions are the most effective, where Russia has been demonstrating some uh, resilience or evasion. So this debate to me should be as more detailed specific as possible not really concentrating on, on macro figures which are misleading. And the second big issue is that, uh, yes, definitely, uh, no question that Russia has significant resilience to sanctions. That factor alone should not disarm us because some people go and say, because Russia has resilience, it means that all of this is useless, as all of this is not working. Yes, there is resilience, but it is limited. Uh, difficulties keep mounting, particularly because of the government's finances uh, being in deep trouble, about which I will say a few words now. Uh, and the situation is getting uh, worse over time, so it's harder for Putin to maintain resilience over time. And we also need to uh, just not to concentrate on, on the overall fact that there is some resilience, but we still need to go and identify weak spots and particularly push on them. Uh, now, uh, speaking about the situation of the moment, I think you all know uh, that uh, the number one topic uh, that should be looked at at the moment is growing budget deficit. Uh, and uh, during the first quarter of this year, uh, officially it had reached 82% of the planned uh, annual uh, deficit that was approved in the federal budget for this year. So two factors here at work. First, uh, the European Union oil embargo and sharp plunge in revenues from oil and gas. Oil and gas revenues were down 45% year on year in the uh, first quarter. It is true that in April, oil price was uh, somewhat bigger as uh, Minister of Finance recently reported, 58, uh, over $58 per barrel of euros crude. But that's still well below uh, the level which was uh, taken into consideration when the federal budget was approved. The current budget was built on the assumption of $70 per barrel. So they still get a lot less revenue uh, from the exports of oil than that was planned. And even you see that even the recent jump in the international oil prices because of the OPEC uh, uh, production cuts did not really fundamentally change the situation. The oil price is still far behind uh, the current uh, budget assumptions. So we, I'll be happy to talk more about that in the Q&A, but the bottom line, uh, last year, Putin was able to avoid a full-blown budget crisis. This year, it is coming. Uh, it is already, uh, already uh, mounting uh, to a great extent. The other factor contributing to this are uh, military expenses. And this was uh, the most significant driver of growth in, in the budget uh, expenditures in the first quarter of the year. As a matter of fact, uh, they have uh, unprecedentedly, they never done it to that extent, 
it's usually very difficult to get the allocated funds out of the Ministry of Finance. You, you really spend months and months doing so. And like by the end of the year, they finally release something. This year, they have done the unprecedented thing. They have financed uh, military expenditures upfront, more than 50% that was allocated for the whole year, just within the first uh, three months which is an illustration that um, they really need money badly uh, for uh, the current combat operations that, that Russians are involved in. And importantly, when people say, uh, are sanctions working or are they not working? It's very important to understand that this increased military spending also leads to a very modest, to put it mildly, intensity of combat. So there was an article uh, last week in The Economist, which I uh, advise everybody to see, which said exactly that, that Russia has the money to continue uh, combat operations of the current intensity, but it does not have uh, the money to increase the intensity of combat. I think that's an important formula to be understood. So sanctions are already working to the extent that it's limiting Putin's ability to wage war, very significantly. And, uh, 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 on top of that, you hear every time that there is a deficit of uh, ammunition, deficit of supplies. You, you saw the recent uh, spat between Prigozhin and Ministry of Defense about insufficient supply of um, uh, artillery uh, ammunition. This is one of the reflections that still uh, all the allocated funds are not enough to sustain uh, combat uh, operations, which is very good news. And uh, uh, I personally believe that particularly if we'll see the large-scale Ukrainian counteroffensive, that the Russian government will have to revise the approved budget uh, for this year to increase military spending even more. What they allocated would not be enough uh, if, if the combat uh, intensifies uh, significantly. That will deepen uh, the budget crisis. Why budget crisis is so important? because uh, private investment is dead. This is what, for those of you who haven't watched, uh, please watch the speech of Oleg Deripaska in March at the Krasnoyarsk Economic Forum. He actually nailed it. He said, we have a situation when no private investment is coming in, but the government will not uh, have the money for everything. Now that is the magic formula. Uh, the government is like the only nail on which this whole construct is hanging. So if the government has financial difficulties, it means we will see serious shortages of uh, financing everywhere. Social spending, uh, economy, industries, and uh, of course, uh, military spending. Uh, capital flight from Russia has been record on, on history, all the recorded history, $227 billion dollars a capital flight last year, and the uh, Russian Central Bank projects all the coming years, 23, 24, 25, at least dozens of billions of uh, dollars net capital flight. So no investment is coming in. Importantly, also we'll be happy to talk about in the Q&A session, uh, there's this a lot of talk about Russia's pivot to Asia as a result of the rift uh, with the West. But no Chinese or Indian or other Asian investors came in since the beginning of the full-scale invasion uh, last year. Zero. Total accumulated FDI from China in Russia is like three, four billion dollars. Three billion dollars. From India, 600 million dollars accumulated FDI, next to nothing. So we have no investment flowing in, uh, everything hanging on, on the government finances. And government finances are running scarce. Uh, we probably will have deficit uh, in this, this year in significant excess uh, of the planned three, three trillion rubles. Whereas in the National Wealth Fund, we only have just over six trillion rubles of so-called liquidity funds, actual cash uh, on the Ministry of Finance accounts in the central bank. The rest of the National Wealth Fund is invested in some government companies, bonds, shares, it's not that easy to recover. So six trillion, it's all that is left uh, in the National Wealth Fund. 
And the deficit for this year is actually, uh, you know, increasing further towards this figure. So this is why Deripaska said that money will be only there for one year. We will see uh, government's rainy day fund expi uh, expiring soon. So that is the key issue. It means the oil embargo is working. Questionable issue whether the price cap is working because it requires a more thorough administration monitoring all these thousands and thousands of transactions with shippers, insurers, and so on. Uh, we will not talk a lot about this, but we have a lot of signs that actually many traders and shippers are uh, moving Russian crude at prices more expensive than the uh, $60 price cap. However, that's the most important thing. Embargo plus the price cap, uh, Russia does not have significant budget revenue. Government finances are in full-blown crisis. And uh, I wanted to finish my introductory remarks with uh, speaking about the, the bigger economic uh, picture, because you will hear a lot uh, about the recovery from the crisis, about industries, uh, GDP, manufacturing, trade, uh, moving into positive territory in year-on-year -year terms. This should not fool anybody, because uh, a Russian statistics agency, Rostat, provides very good, and I'll be happy to supply this to colleagues, provides very good illustrative graphs of um, industrial output, manufacturing output, agricultural output, as a percentage to like average level of 2020 or 2021. So if you look at these pictures seasonally adjusted, you'll see that it's more or less flat. So there's no real recovery is only because of the low base in comparison to worst months and quarters of last year when everything fell. But if you actually look at uh, a bigger time span seasonally adjusted, you will see that it's more like stagnation rather than recovery. And to push it up, investments are needed. It is not coming. And the headwinds of switching to Asia are very strong because logistics are terribly expensive, which is also a significant pro-inflationary effect. Inflation is also picking up because of the deficit of the budget and uh, uh, this fiscal expansion, because of more expensive logistics of trade with Asia. Importantly, because of severe shortage of skilled labor, because of Putin's war and mobilization, many people left Russia, uh, many people were drafted and sent to the front. A lot of them were really skilled employees. So if you look at Putin's speech at the Russian Industrialists Union in March, like everybody was like two and a half hour footage. Everybody who was speaking was saying labor shortage, skilled labor shortage. That's the number one problem. It's also, as uh, Nabiulin, the chairman of Central Bank, says, a very strong pro-inflationary effect. So uh, if you look at the whole uh, picture, uh, that really, I mean, uh, Russia and Russian government and Putin, they like to cherry pick on some of the indicators which might still look good. Don't be fooled by that. There's actually no recovery, more like stagnation. The investment question will be central. Um, all eyes here will be on government. Government does not have enough uh, money. And also, uh, importantly, uh, if you, th this is a last sentence which uh, I would describe the status of the Russian economy. If you really look at the breakdown of G GDP dynamics and the industrial output dynamics, you will see an emerging very strong split between a normal civic economy and everything related to the war. Uh, you see that production like finished metal products, like electronic and optical uh, produce and, and so on, everything is going up. GDP is going significantly up in uh, governance, administrative, military activity, construction. Manufacturing industries, trade, communications, and all of the private economy essentially is going down. So we have this uh, split, which is reminding us of a Soviet-style economy. Yes, we did have this major military sector, which was thriving, uh, receiving a lot of cash. People there had good salaries and so on. But the rest of the economy was degrading. Uh, so it happened in the Soviet Union. We're clearly moving towards that territory. Uh, and that will have major uh, social, economic, and probably political consequences for Putin, which we are yet to discuss. 
but the split into a military and normal civic economy is very visible right now, which means that uh, a lot of uh, the Western sanctions and pull out of Western companies have contributed to that, which means that yes, uh, sanctions are working to a great uh, extent. I'll finish here. We'll be happy to listen to colleagues and take questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Vladimir. Thanks a lot. Really, a lot of uh, evidence, a lot of numbers. Uh, so that is why we shall expect your your update of uh, of your paper. You know, in order really to use those data for our for our ideas and proposals here in the European Parliament and other uh, you know bodies. Now, uh, I would ask uh, Maria Snegovaya. Uh, postdoctoral fellow in Georgetown University World School of Foreign Service, and uh, I was enjoying recently reading uh, some of, of uh, papers uh, exactly on sanctions produced by Maria and, and, and the whole team of experts. So, Maria, please draw is yours. Thank you very much, Andres and Vladimir. It's a big honor to be here. Uh, so among other things, I'm also currently a senior fellow at the CSIS, and I'm grateful to Vladimir for having indirectly cited the report that we just published, uh, which was the subsequently actually the basis of the Economist article uh, that he referenced. Uh, so as much as I'd like to, uh, you know, join in the optimism that Vladimir's presentation um, has said, unfortunately, according to our analysis, things do not look as, um, I'd say, straightforward. I'm not certainly the one to argue against uh, the point that sanctions work, they do. But the problem is that um, uh, some analysts have suggested sanctions always work, right? If you impose certain restrictions, if you look hard enough, you'll always find the effects of sanctions. The problem, are they getting us closer to the intended effects? And this is something that I wanted to talk a little bit more. Now, what were the intended effects of, effects of sanctions? Uh, some analysts, uh, like, of, like some people believe it's a regime change in Russia, <laughs> go as far as to suggest that. Another thing is just some effect on Russian economy. But in reality, what we are trying to achieve with the sanctions, and that was repeatedly echoed by the EU politicians, is to cripple the Kremlin's ability to finance the war and impose clear economic and political costs on Russia's political elite responsible for the invasion. Now, how closely have we gotten there one year in? Well, uh, when it comes to the broader uh, macroeconomic effects, especially after introduction of the EU embargo and the oil embargo and the oil price gap, here I will echo Vladimir finally, a year in, we are beginning uh, to see some of the effects. However, uh, we did lose a year, that's for sure. Like last year, the sanctions did not deliver the effects that we were hoping. Uh, the financial sanctions probably, as we come to realize, are not as effective against um, oil exporting economies. And before, uh, finally, sanctions were hit uh, Russia's energy revenues. As a matter of fact, Russia last year enjoyed unprecedented uh, scale of oil revenues, which effectively helped to recover uh, much of the foreign uh, currency reserves, uh, which were originally blocked by the sanctions. Uh, now, it's again, to underestimate the effect of the Western policy community, I actually applaud the effort that was able to achieve the, um, the energy sanctions at effect effectively a very um, quick speed um, uh, by any standards. But unfortunately, last year was not uh, uh, the year where we were able to constrain the Kremlin's ability to fight this war. Uh, now, what about this year? Indeed, uh, as Vladimir has suggested, uh, especially looking at the budget, the effects are starting to be felt, uh, but there not everything is very clear just yet, because unfortunately, we're in the long-term cat-mouse game uh, with the Kremlin. Uh, that means that we impose certain sanctions, the Kremlin figures out the way to get around it. Right now, as we speak, well, they're looking for the ways to increase uh, budget revenues, right, by changing the taxes, the way taxes on the energy com producing companies are levied, and uh, also actively seeking for alternative ways to extract money from the Russian society. Uh, they're probably not going to be able to fully compensate for uh, for the looming budget deficits. Again, I'm not going to be repeating everything that Vladimir has said, but also probably not going to be facing a catastrophic situation with the budget, at least not this year. Uh, they definitely have um, a lot of um, um, flexibility way going uh, forward for at least uh, several years. Uh, Alexander, uh, 
uh, Sergei Alexashenko, one of the uh, top Russians, uh, macroeconomic observers, uh, actually believes that the war uh, remains fairly low cost for the Kremlin when it comes to purely budget terms, and specifically when it comes to the Kremlin's ability to fight this war, to finance this war um, in like an accrued way, just the military expenditures. Unfortunately, with all these considerations in mind, uh, the Kremlin still has this ability going forward for many years ahead. Uh, now, in the recent report, more, specific, um, more um, specifically talking about Russia's defense uh, sector, um, at the CSIS, we looked at the effect of sanctions, especially export uh, controls, on uh, Russian defense. Uh, we do understand that the microeconomic, yes, things are not getting, going great, but as I said, uh, the Kremlin uh, retains the capacity to finance this war for uh, a long uh, period of time. But maybe we see some really crippling effect of sanctions on Russia's defense. Uh, so what do we find? Indeed, uh, export controls, they work in the sense that they do create um, issues for the Kremlin to compensate for particularly some high-tech uh, technologies in certain areas. We also find uh, that there are specific um, uh, components uh, that are necessary for uh, the defense sector, such as, for example, the optics uh, or the um, uh, bearings, uh, interestingly, where indeed, as a result of the sanctions, the Kremlin is facing some uh, deficiencies. Having said that, our broader conclusion is that, unfortunately, with all of these considerations in mind, the Kremlin still retains the ability to fight this war, even if it's not going to be a blitzkrieg, full-scale, full-blown type of war. It's going to be a war of attrition. Uh, so effectively, we see that sanctions create some deficiencies that the Kremlin has to circumvent uh, by either, for example, using the Soviet stocks uh, of the equipment and remodeling uh, this old equipment, uh, sending it to war, or uh, by using always willing uh, second and third countries uh, to circumvent um, sanctions by importing uh, some of the equipment that, or some of the components that are no longer accessible from the West uh, for third parties. Uh, we see that, unfortunately, that capacity to continuously do that is still uh, there. Uh, to give you an example, uh, for example, when it comes to the tank um, industry, again, uh, the Kremlin did uh, face uh, some of the effect of the sanctions. It's harder uh, to produce uh, many tanks at the high rate. Uh, the Kremlin has also lost, uh, keeps losing a lot of tanks on the battlefield. Uh, if they approximately uh, the rate of approximately uh, 150 tanks per month. Uh, however, the Kremlin is also able uh, to produce about 20 new tanks per month and uh, to remodel uh, all the uh, Soviet tanks at the rate of approximately 90 tanks per month. So overall, that gives us about 110 tanks per month, and it's losing 150. Uh, so it's still um, it's a negative situation for the Kremlin because the more tanks are lost than are uh, produced. But it's also a manageable situation in which, yes, there will give you fewer tanks, but there's still a lot of tanks and there's many more than what uh, Ukraine possesses going forward. Uh, looking at the missiles, uh, we see pretty much the same uh, situation. Uh, there was no lack of uh, military analysts last year predicting that the Kremlin is going to run out of the missiles altogether, and that will hopefully stop uh, this uh, disastrous attacks uh, on Ukraine that, again, by the way, have intensified uh, in the recent weeks. Uh, instead, what we see is that, indeed, uh, the Kremlin are not able to produce the missiles needed for um, the, um, these attacks at the consistent rates. So that only means effectively that the missiles that are flying to Ukraine, not, not all of them are new. Some of them are remodeled. Some of them are used from uh, the equipment, that, from the types of systems that are usually used as defensive, like S-300, rather than offensive types of missiles. And many of these missiles are not uh, very high precision missiles. But unfortunately, uh, yeah, and it's also decreased the frequency of the attacks somewhat, although we don't necessarily see a very pronounced pardon. 
But the point being that, unfortunately, the missiles are still flying to Ukraine. And even if they're not high precision, they're still able to deliver a lot of damage and wreck on uh, the suffering uh, Ukrainian society. Essentially, the same situation we see everywhere else with the microchips. I'm sure you've seen a lot of analysis showing that uh, there's, uh, and the Kremlin is able to import a lot of uh, microchips through, again, other countries outside of the West that are willing to assist. And even if, for example, the quality of the Chinese uh, microchips is not great, some of the 30 to 40% end up being defective, there's still the remaining 60-70% uh, that are working and again, allowing the Kremlin to continue this war. So our conclusion is that, yes, sanctions work. And this is where I concur with Vladimir in the sense that they create shortages of certain high-end uh, high components and force uh, the Russian DOD to substitute them with lower quality alternatives. But at the same time, uh, the Kremlin is quite sophisticated in finding the way around the sanctions. And uh, again, there's no lack of willing uh, countries uh, that are making a lot of money by helping the Kremlin circumvent the sanctions. And this will be the case going forward, I'm afraid. And even at the current uh, rate of the sanctions and um, the equipment losses, uh, the Russia still has a lot of capacity to continue this war of attrition. It's going to be a, a war that uh, meant to exhaust uh, Ukraine and meant to exhaust the Western capacity to support uh, Ukraine um, uh, going forward. This is going to be a long war. And again, rest assured that Putin and the Kremlin are prepared for it. So as commendable as the sanctions effort has been, the Western sanction effort has been uh, in the last years, I'm afraid uh, we need to keep up our, um, our ability to, again, to push this forward and again, to help, eventually to help Ukraine win. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Maria. Thanks a lot. And now we're moving to Elina Rybakova, Deputy Chief Economist, Institute of International Finance and uh, I would simply uh, advertise that on chat, you can see several links to important uh, reports or papers produced by Elena. So Elena, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for fighting the publications. Just to let the audience know that I have uh, left the IAF and I'm now with uh, a senior fellow with Peterson Institute, Bruegel. And I'm also working with the Kiev School of Economics Institute. So I'm very proud to promote the publications that we have recently done with the Kiev School of Economics uh, Institute. So it's uh, very hard to follow both uh, uh, Vladimir and Maria because I agree with a lot of the findings. Uh, so I'll just focus on a few details. And also there is a question, uh, I think, Thing that sort of sets the stage nicely. Should we be focusing on the enforcement of the existing sanctions or should we uh, introduce more sanctions? So of course, we're on the TENS package and the young in Europe. So my first point is we absolutely have to focus on the enforcement of the existing sanctions. And one of the publications which we put forward, we have updated uh, with the latest transaction by transactions data on the oil price cap and embargo. And we can clearly see that specifically from uh, Pacific ports and the result of uh, some of our work, we've also seen off take action, but we see that uh, specifically from Pacific ports, Kuzmino port in uh, Russia, shipments that are going to China, some other countries as well, 96% um, of those shipments are above the price cap. So we have the nice charts and reports, you can have a look. We are working also, of course, to match this data, the sort of the transaction by transaction data. We're matching it with the beneficial ownership of the companies. We're matching it with the data on the shipment and the PEI insurance. But when 96% of the shipments from the port are, are above the price cap, the work of matching is not too hard. It's not that I'm matching, you know, something 50 or 40, it's 96%. We also know that um, more than uh, roughly 50% of uh, the shipments from that port are, are now being done with insurance or shippers uh, from G7. So that to me suggests that we have a problem where a lot of the second parties to the contract, so you have the first party to the contract is the trader from Russia with the trader from China. That's the first parties of the contracts, they conclude the contract. Then we have the secondary parties of this contract, the ones that have to provide the formations. They see these contracts, but at the same time, it may be 
potentially flawed contracts, not fully reporting the actual price. They see it, they report in the attestation that yes, we're shipping something that is below the price cap. However, either the trader may be raising the red, should be raising the red flag, you know, specifically for the attestations. There are certain guidelines which should raise the red flags. And therefore, the second part is the contract should, when they provide the attestation, maybe they shouldn't do the attestation, or they should be very explicit that we have these traders that are potentially raising the red flags. Or for the authorities, given this sort of data matching, matching that we have done as independent analysts, it's something that they should definitely follow up through. And we have seen action from OFAC. We've seen UK collecting the attestations, but not yet following up on them. And we would like, of course, to see more from the European Union. So in terms of the enforcement, specifically oil, oil price cap and the um, embargo, it's important that we have an authority within the G7 or individual member states that collect the attestations, check for the red flags, ask for the audits, and then there is serious there are serious repercussions. Not that maybe the shipper is included for 60 or 90 days. That's maybe too little of a repercussion for, for a shipper. They just step back. But for more uh, heavy fines and potentially longer periods of uh, break from having from being able to operate uh, a lot of uh, discussion has worked on the russia's so-called shadow fleet and the shadow fleet is something that we define and there isn't a clear definition out there but we define as the fleet that doesn't need foreign insurance and is not owned by for well, rather not foreign g7 insurance those who do comply with the cap um, and uh, is not registered in one of the G7 countries. So that's how we define the shadow fleet. We don't define it as any potential shadow fleet. And I think there is a lot of confusion regarding this. Um, and I'll explain that in a second. So we estimate that shadow fleet at roughly 150 ships. And that is not enough to move all the required oil by sea for Russia. It is roughly enough for about 30% of it. So still, the G7 community has a lot of leverage, and particularly Europe, in terms of enforcing the price cap. We, you might have heard the numbers of up to 600 shadow fleet, and I think that is maybe a confusion that arose from one of the interviews by the experts. And that confusion likely pertains to the fact that we have the ships that maybe were highly operational for maybe 10 years or so, and then they get sold on the market for traders that will open the ships maybe for a couple of years only and this might be available for russia to buy and about i think roughly maybe 200 oh, sorry 600 or so every year come on that market and some of it is not some of it will go to fully legitimate shippers who will decide to use it for something else for higher cost for a couple of years and then write it off but this is not the total shadow fleet that is available to russia so therefore, I would say that still, Russia's shadow fleet is potentially maybe at only 140 ships. It is not enough to fully cover the oil that needs to be moved. And therefore, EU in particular has a lot of leverage here still. If it wants to pursue, and I'm sure it wants to pursue, um, uh, auditing and better sort of enforcement and implementation of the sanctions. This is even more important than now we're taking sort of, you have a paper here on the oil price gap. It is even more important for the oil products where, again, Russia's capacity and the sophistication of the required ships is even more limited. So again, on the oil products, we have uh, more leverage. For those who are particularly interested, should look at the paper and definitely come back to us because we still see some shipment of oil into Russian traders, register, oh, sorry, into companies registered in Europe. I'm very well aware of the a fact that certain countries have exemptions, and of course we know Bulgaria and a few others. Others have uh, voluntarily have, have an exemption, but they have voluntarily stopped buying Russian oil. But at the same time, we still have transactions going through. So therefore it would be important for the relevant authorities to follow up. It could be that maybe there are some Russian refineries, uh, maybe in Italy or maybe in another country, and maybe without us fully realizing they're continuing to receive some of the shipments. And I think it could be false flag, red flag in our data, but we cannot know for sure if there isn't a follow up from the authorities. So this is just to sort of answer to you briefly on the oil price gap and the embargo. What is the data that we have sort of triangulating all the data that we have providing the evidence that there is avoidance of the oil price gap and we need to do much more.
So uh, moving on to the next, uh, well, uh, the expert controls, and, and Maria talked uh, a lot about it and gave very comprehensive overview. Uh, what we do want to just sort of I very much agree with uh, Maria and to highlight that we still see the on shipment by third parties. And this are a group of countries either quote unquote friendly to Russia, in particular UAE, maybe still Turkey, uh, of course China, or countries that are bordering Russia. And for countries that are bordering Russia, it is not always from bad intent. You know, of course, there are some companies with bad intent, but also sometimes there is an issue of the complexity of implementation of the um, uh, uh, export controls. If you're customs officials and you have to decide which ship is sanctioned or not, it can be very complicated at the border, especially if you do not have a clear translation from the information that is, uh, that is the, the chip that is under export control and potentially ends up in the missile to, to Ukraine versus any other type of chip. So therefore, I think we need to be more forceful in terms of the implementation, but also think about the old policy recommendations, which we ourselves apply, for example, for tax policy. When you're doing a VAT, you have a certain level, you make sure you have cash registers, that's cash administra uh, tax administration, but you also don't do some an excessively complex regime with a lot of exemptions. You're trying to have a flat rate with broad coverage. So therefore, it might be to make ourselves, uh, our lives is easier in terms of enforcing and implementing sanctions. Of course, we have to put effort into this administration, but we also might want to think that we will, might want to have a broader restrictions on export controls. Yes, maybe some things will fall into it, which we don't want to fall into, for sort of strictly speaking, we do not want them to see fall into this category. But given the possibility for dual, dual use of so many civilian products, we might just have to say, look, we have very broad coverage of export controls on Russia, and this is it. Because otherwise, our implementation just gets too cumbersome, and Russia gets pretty much everything that it needs. And we see evidence, uh, especially from the countries that are bordering Russia, and it is, of course, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Armenia, uh, but sometimes even other countries that, especially in the beginning of the war, much less so now, uh, we are still on shipping some of the products from the European Union to Russia. So that is um, the second point. So first I talked about the oil price cap, uh, then we talked about the uh, export controls. And finally, the big ticket item uh, to summarize, you know, uh, and I don't want to extrapolate more than what Vladimir and Maria, Maria said, sanctions working or not. Sanctions are working. I don't think we, you know, we need to continue that debate. I know it's still raging in, in, in European press. And it's extremely important, as Vladimir pointed out, we, we can't, like Putin, cherry pick a few indicators. You know, if we, if we pick up the same indicator that Putin has cherry picked, of course, we're going to find that they're not working, right? Uh, but of course, if we are sort of have a broader approach, we will see many, many sort of points of evidence that sanctions are working. Uh, however, if uh, we think that sanctions will stop the war, that Russia will become bankrupt in the next couple of months, I don't think that is a realistic expectation. Sanctions are working. Sanctions are undermining, sanctions are hurting Russia, which was already very painful. Russia had very low potential growth. Russia had issues with investment climate. Russia had issues with labor supply. And sanctions are undermining all of these factors, and particularly, of course, productivity. But it's not going to happen fast enough to help Ukraine uh, on this, for example, summer's counteroffensive. So therefore, coming back to the world price cap, better enforcement is what we need to do. And of course, continuing to press against the um, sort of Russian propaganda of saying that sanctions are not working at all and we might as well give up. And finally, I want to highlight just how well Europe managed last year. If you remember last sort of uh, going back 12 months ago when we were focusing on the analysis and even myself, I was a highly skeptical. Nobody, many people were expecting double digit contraction in many European countries that were highly reliant on Russian energy. Nonetheless, we found evidence of substitution and as region as a whole managed to pivot almost entirely away from Russian energy. It has taken only a year after almost a decade of uh, sort of increased reliance on Russian uh, energy and almost more than 40% reliance on some of the Russian energy imports. So I think we should also um, focus on the negatives, but we should also sort of focus on the positives, on the fact how dynamic and European economies have proven to be and how sort of uh, strategically 
forward thinking this year uh, in terms of the response on energy security front and uh, growth output for Europe. So here I will stop and, and I'll pass on to uh, the floor to you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Elena. Thanks a lot. And now we are moving to Ilya Matveev, political economist research at University of California. So Ilya, please take the floor. Thank you so much. So I agree with uh, the things my colleagues uh, said. Uh, just a few additional observations. Uh, I think that um, the possibility of fiscal crisis in Russia uh, this year, uh, as uh, Maria said, is actually limited uh, because on the one hand, uh, most of these uh, extreme uh, expenses in the first months of this year were advanced contracts with uh, the Russian military industrial uh, complex, as Vladimir said, and uh, the expenses are bound to decrease. The speed of expenses is bound to decrease, but at the same time, uh, revenues will probably increase because there is an adjustment in the tax mechanism and uh, the Russian government is uh, learning to better tax uh, the oil sector in this unusual situation. So probably uh, the uh, fiscal deficit this year will stay under 3.5% 3, 3 of the GDP, which is a manageable number for, uh, for the Russian government and uh, for the Russian financial bloc. <clears throat> so uh, I would also like to raise the issue of uh, personal sanctions. So I think uh, there is a certain imbalance between the broad uh, sectoral sanctions and uh, the personal sanctions against uh, Russian officials and uh, uh, businessmen. Uh, on the one hand, basically almost every sector of the Russian economy is uh, sanctioned at the moment. So uh, the overall number of sanctions is in the thousands and even more extreme measures are debated, like a complete uh, ban of uh, G7 countries' exports uh, to Russia. So there is a very vigorous activity, you know, on this front, uh, increasing, constantly increasing the sectoral sanctions and uh, um, improving enforcement. And at the same time, in terms of personal sanctions, I think there is a certain uh, stagnation because Overall, something like uh, 1,500 Russian individuals were sanctioned, and uh, the Anti-Corruption Foundation offered a list of 7,000 people. Uh, Ukrainian authorities offered the list of 25,000 people. Uh, so uh, out of, for instance, out of the big businessmen, so-called oligarchs on the Anti-Corruption Foundation's list, uh, there are 72 individuals there, and uh, 30 of them were not sanctioned by any Western country. And uh, uh, many more, in fact, are sanctioned only by one or two countries, but not by the European Union. So I think there is a certain imbalance here, because uh, uh, sectoral sanctions involve difficult trade-offs. So, uh, for instance, uh, decreasing the price cap uh, might result in another spike in the oil prices, in the energy prices. And this is understandable that uh, Western governments were quite careful with uh, uh, the energy sanctions. But with the personal sanctions, the trade-offs are much smaller. And at the same time, uh, the level of activity <laughs> is also smaller. Uh, so um, in terms of asset freezes in the European Union, we see that uh, Switzerland uh, froze uh, something to the tune of $8 uh, billion of Russian assets. And uh, Swiss authorities admitted that, in fact, only uh, about 100 Russian individuals hold assets to the tune of uh, $50 billion uh, in Swiss banks. So uh, not, not just ordinary Russians or just wealthy Russians, but uh, the wealthiest uh, part of the Russian society holds uh, uh, tens of billions and probably hundreds of billions of dollars uh, in, in assets in Switzerland and uh, other European countries. And these assets were not uh, frozen. And I think uh, this is possible. And personal sanctions also involve a clear political mechanism because uh, they put pressure uh, on the Russian elites 
and uh, forced them uh, to choose between uh, uh, opposing uh, the war clearly in order to uh, delist from this personal sanctions list uh, or, or, or be loyal to the Kremlin and then lose everything uh, in Europe and in the West. And I think that this instrument is underutilized. So I think there could be more, uh, more action taken here. Uh, because uh, this general purpose of weakening the Russian economy, uh, it's, it's quite broad and there is a lot of room to adapt, as we saw uh, in, in the previous months, in the previous year. But with personal sanctions, I think uh, there is every opportunity for increased pressure. So, and also there are like specific lists of people prepared by different institutions and uh, all of that could be analyzed and uh, this could be put into force. So this was my short intervention. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thanks a lot, uh, Ilya. Now we are moving to our last speaker, uh, Tom uh, Kittinger, who is joining us uh, uh, from his uh, cycling holiday. So that's... Uh, it's again you know, very close to my heart, so I simply I am <laughs> envying. Uh, so Tom, can you can you take the floor? Yes, I can take the floor. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, perfect, perfect. Perfect, perfect. You know, um, I keep passing signs as I cycle along in Italy, uh, saying that the internet is uh, funded by the European Union. So I'm hoping it's going to work well. Anyway, <clears throat> so I've been sitting here. Um, crossing out my notes as everyone else has said everything I was going to say. So I thought I would, um, I want to go back to uh, mid to late 2021. Uh, uh, and I want to go back then because uh, we were all reading um, statements from politicians as the military buildup uh, occurred uh, by Russia on the border with Ukraine. And then of course, uh, even more intensely in early 2022, we were reading multiple promises when it came to what sanctions were going to achieve. And I think when we talk about the impact of sanctions, we kind of need to look back and say, what were the intentions that we were told, we as citizens uh, were told that these sanctions were going to, to achieve? Uh, you know, some people were even talking about setting the Russian economy back for a generation, uh, preventing the Russian military from conducting the kinds of um, uh, attacks uh, and invasions that it has inflicted on Ukraine uh, on, on any other country. And the question I always ask people in the, in the UK Foreign Office, and it's slightly tongue in cheek, but those of us who have written funding applications to grant makers for years and years, I always say, what was the theory of change when you started announcing sanctions? What was it you were trying to achieve? Now we know that initially, of course, we were trying to uh, deter Putin from his full scale invasion. And that failed on the 24th of February. So in that regard, mm -hmm. sanctions did not work. Now, those on the call, many of whom have um, economic backgrounds, uh, have been through the numbers and can point to uh, how the impact is, is occurring. But I think we just do need to go back and um, ask ourselves the question, you know, were political leaders communicating effectively back at that time? Because we run the risk of having overpromised on what sanctions were going to achieve and underdelivered. And I think that's really important. I think that's a very important point to unpack because we already see in some countries, um, I know it was a something of a sham referendum, but nonetheless, we've seen in Hungary, 97% uh, of the population think that sanctions are a bad idea. Uh, and we will see without doubt, we will see the damage that sanctions are doing to European economies. And, uh, and I, by the way, I'm fully in favor of sanctions, but I think we do need to bear in mind that over time, the sanctions effect on European economies will be harnessed by those that want to argue for whatever the national equivalent of Brexit is in your country, will be harnessed by more extreme uh, political uh, uh, groups. So I think it's absolutely critical that we think about how we communicate these impacts, which the others have pointed to, how we communicate these to our citizens, because there are people in the European Union who have lost their jobs because of sanctions uh, on Russia. Um, there are people who look at the situation and probably listen to the propaganda coming from the Kremlin uh, that the sanctions are not affecting them, 
they are affecting the West to, to a greater extent. And I do think we need to uh, bear that in mind as we continue what I fear will be a long journey. So I think that's the first point I wanted to make. The second point I wanted to make is that obviously um, there is tremendous activity going on, uh, the jet fuel being burnt by David O'Sullivan and other uh, sanctions envoys from the United States and from the United Kingdom and so on, is considerable going and visiting third countries, trying to um, persuade them that this dog leg, this cutout trade that they are facilitating needs to stop. And clearly uh, that uh, needs to, to continue. But I do think we need to look closely within our own European borders. We run a project at RUSI called um, SIFMANET, the Sanctions and Illicit Finance Monitoring and Analysis Network, which allows us to go and visit uh, member states, kick the tires and see how are things going. And we get some pretty varied feedback uh, on how are things going. Uh, for example, in one country, we were told, well, on trade sanctions, we haven't really started to implement those yet because we need these sectors to get up to speed on understanding what sanctions are. That was said just under a year after the sanctions started. Well, that's not acceptable. Um, other countries where we've, we've tried to engage on sanctions, and they simply don't want to engage with us because it's not a conversation that they want to, they want to have. So I do think we need to look at home. We need to make sure that we are properly, um, we are properly implementing sanctions um, uh, at home. I would like to say another point, which is that I would recognize just how far the EU has come. Um, I think a number of people have referenced the fact that the European Union you know, has been more coordinated and has demonstrated externally more unity than I think anyone would have expected. But I also want to point how far the EU has come in bending its historical position on, on sanctions. So in other words, the idea that the EU might be, you know, can now sanction entities in third countries that are facilitating EU sanctions evasion that was brought in uh, late last year, that I think is a position that most um, EU policymakers would have not considered um, uh, in late 2021, early 2022. We all know how much uh, the EU resists secondary sanctions from the United States, we're not a million miles away from that in the European Union. And that's something that I think one could never have imagined. And frankly, something I think that members of the European Parliament should be advocating for, because if we want to close the net as much as possible, if we want to shut down the dogleg, the cutout transactions that are occurring on trade. We need to have the power to sanction um, those, um, those entities in, in third countries. Which brings me to my last point, which is that of course, the political rhetoric is important. Of course, engaging with politicians is, is important. But let's remember that trade is conducted by the private sector. And um, just to advertise myself briefly, I um, published a, an op-ed in the uh, Financial Times on Monday just past. And my argument there was, we need to make the private sector in these third countries recognize that continuing to make money out of um, the, the Russian military out of uh, the Kremlin's war in Ukraine is unacceptable. And if you want to do that, if you choose to do that, then that is the end of your relationship with the world's biggest trading bloc, the European Union. So I do think we need to put more pressure um, on, on the private sector. Uh, the private sector has had um, a, you know, a year um, to get familiar with these sanctions in, in Europe um, and not respecting those sanctions. It's their choice. Of course, it's their choice as private sector entities in third countries. But it's also our choice in the European Union to shut them out of our market. So I do think that in 2023, we need to tighten the net. Um, we need to be more robust. Um, uh, and we need to recognize that actually, as the European Union, we have some cards to play that we have not yet played. Uh, and frankly, on behalf of the Ukrainian people, it's high time we did. So I end my uh, remarks there and look forward to the questions and the discussions. Well, thanks a lot, Tom. Uh, really, I forgot uh, enjoying your your bicycle tour. I, I forgot to introduce, you know, <laughs> other your you know uh, features of your of your professional work. So, Tom Keating is director of the Center for Financial Crime and Security Studies from from Rusi, from uh, Royal United Service Institute. So, great to have you here with us. Uh, so. Uh, Again, I would uh, suggest that you know those who want to put the questions, uh, they should write them into the chat. There are 
few of them, but I maybe will start from uh, myself, you know. Uh, uh, again you know to to understand where we are and uh, what next we uh, are going to do and i saw in some way two different you know maybe opinions vladimir was very clear saying that look you know sanctions are working especially you know on uh, sanctions on oil price cap and embargo and russian you know income budgetary income is going down and you know and this year can be really very tough uh, for Russian budget. Uh, then Maria and, and somebody else were saying, uh, it's not very clear, is that, you know, is, is that really so painful or not? And uh, so my, my, my question would be, you know, uh, so really what, uh, what should we expect? In my view, you uh, know, really, uh, at least, you know, I'm not an economist. I, I, I need to confess my background, you know, besides being in politics, uh, even as a prime minister at some time, but I came to politics from physics. So like, uh, like Angela Merkel almost, you know. <laughs> but I am, uh, I'm looking into some kind of logic, you know. So really last year for Russian economy and finances was not so bad. We can we can say you know well we were expecting you know that sanctions will be much more painful but uh, nevertheless if you look into the numbers income budget and so on was not so painful but what was the reason is at least in my view the reason was not that sanctions which were introduced like embargo and so on were not effective but simply because of the war the prices for oil and gas in the global markets increased. Uh, very much, and and that is why Russians, Russian budget got all those you know surpluses, and and that not the sanctions created that you know increase of the prices, at least in my opinion, simply the whole you know geopolitical crisis, uh, and you know and, and the mood in the in the global markets created some kind of this uh, increase of the prices, which Russia was uh, very very good to use you know to finance their war, but now the prices in general are going down. Markets are becoming more calm, and then we see, you know, uh, effects of of sanctions on oil. How much they are affecting, you know, incomes to to the budget. So should we? My question would be very simple: Should we continue in that direction? I saw in some reports, for example, proposals to uh, to cut down uh, price cap from 60 to 30 U.S. dollars uh, per barrel, because uh, at least what what those reports are saying that the uh, uh, price for production is only 15 uh, US dollars per bar. So should we go into that direction or not? I don't know if, if G7 will agree, but I'm, I'm asking you know, a theoretical question. Is, is that, is that, will that bring you know, additional, additional uh, cuts in the, in the income? Second, there are you know, uh, other areas like, uh, can we do something with uh, uh, with the products uh, from refineries, which are somewhere in the third countries, uh, and which refine, you know, Russian oil, and then they were selling uh, those refined products into European markets. So what's, what to do with that? And the last question, of course, what uh, I don't remember who Elena perhaps was speaking about, is that 50% uh, of Russian oil still are transported by G7 tankers and, and insurance companies. So what should to do with that? No, how much can we cut? But first of all, I don't know. You know, maybe Vladimir, can you can you respond since you have been, you know, uh, speaking about the impact? And Maria was a little bit, you know, uh, how to say, yeah. not so much convinced. So can you bring yeah, yeah. additional arguments? Sure, uh, Andres, uh, please don't be shy. You uh, were involved in great economic crisis management when you were <laughs> prime minister, so you are the economist in this room. So uh, the first, uh, I wanted to say that what I really like about this discussion is there's a lot of uh, specificity. Uh, that's the way it should be. So when people argue that sanctions have limited or no effect, but they also give a lot of specific examples, that is, that is a good thing. And I do not have anything against that because this, this, there's a room for policymakers to actually address these issues. And really, there are areas which, where Russia have been faring better in the face of sanctions, so we should address that. But there are also some other areas where sanctions have actually been very effective and we need to double down. 
so specificity is uh, what is really needed. Now, what I don't like is uh, two things. First, comparing the effects of sanctions to some abstract goals. I don't like, when you listen to Western politicians, you, you'll see a lot of cacophony. Some, everybody has different views on what were actually the goals of sanctions. I think we should drop this debate. Uh, it's not really useless and it creates a lot of unnecessary doubt because I think we all agree that sanctions do create a lot of constraints. And even if Russia finds the way uh, to still get along on the background of sanctions, there's still a lot of trouble Yes, they have a shadow tanker fleet, but it's more expensive to have it. And it's also creating a lot of room for tax avoidance for the market players, so the budget gets less. Yes, they do uh, have some Indian or uh, Middle East traders uh, reselling Russian oil and products, but they still lose, lose a lot of money on that. Yes, they switch to imports from Asia, but it's terribly more expensive than uh, trading with uh, Europe, given the fact that majority of Russia's population and economic activity is in European Russia. So Russia is geographically part of, most of Russia is very, very distant from Asia, so logistics are uh, expensive. Yes, they can, of course, impose some extra taxes on some industries on the population to solve the fiscal problems, but this will curb growth. Yes, they can adjust uh, oil export taxation mechanism, but this is exactly what we had in 1980s. Uh, this is brilliantly explained in Igor Gaidar's book, uh, Death of the Empire, when the Communist Party actually put more and more fiscal pressure on the oil industry. Ultimately, it uh, uh, was followed by a collapse of oil production, which began in 1988. So uh, there is, uh, I mean, yes, Russia can find ways to circumvent or get along, but it's more costly and we need to be fully aware of that. And yes, sanctions are putting a lot of constraints also on the war. I strongly argue that uh, uh, things would have been different with the scenarios of war. Many people, when Putin made this full scale assault, they, they said, Ukraine will fall as a matter of days or weeks and so on. It didn't happen. And of course, the key factor was the brave Ukrainian resistance, but sanctions also contributed because in the course of last spring, when Russia was still, tanks were around Kiev and they uh, mouth attempting a second siege and so on, you could hear that the biggest issue was supply. Supply problems here, supply problems there. Why? Because of money constraints. And here I come uh, to the point that was said by Ilya, that they can manage the fiscal crisis. I mean, if you look at the trees, yes, but there's also forest behind them because very clearly they won't have enough money to finance intensified combat. So uh, economists take like the 5 trillion rubles that were allocated for Ministry of Defense this year as okay, they got it, uh, so fiscally they will manage it. But this will clearly not be enough. Ministry of Defense very soon, and in defense industries also very soon, they will come and ask for more. So they will need to revise budget expenditure up or face shortages on the battlefield. Yes, they can increase taxes, but this will curb uh, economic uh, recovery. So they, they really, they are trying to manage, but they don't have good options and sanctions are creating a lot of constraints. Where I would agree with colleagues is yes, much more can be done and it should be done more efficiently, which is why there was a question in the chat, what is the priority? What should be the priority? Enforcing already introduced sanctions or adopting some new ones? There's definitely a room for new sanctions. And yeah, I saw another question about Rosatom. Andrews had a very good discussion about uh, Rosatom and sanctioning Russian nuclear industry uh, recently. Please watch. Rosatom, metals, diamonds, gold, everything should be on the list. Uh, there was a good, a very good list put down by Mark Fall, your Mark Group. Actually a comprehensive set of uh, recommendations for further sanctions. But to me, enforcement is key because also poor enforcement discredits the sanctions as an instrument and allows more room for people to say, oh, they're not efficient, they're not working, so we need to reconsider. That is a bad sentiment. 
I strongly oppose this whole debate that sanctions are somehow not working. To actually uh, improve that, we need to prioritize and focus on enforcement, and there is a lot to do. Uh, uh, finishing this and addressing your question, Andrews, about the oil price cap. Lowering oil price cap will be a good thing. Uh, it will further escalate the budget crisis, which is the key issue for, for the Russian economy right now. But uh, first, we need to really address, address enforcement because the colleagues were absolutely right, pointing out that there's a hell of a lot of trade in Russian oil happening above the price cap. And we need to do something about it. And this should be looked at thor thoroughly and seriously. So argument, this is at least a comparable thing with lowering the price cap, because if you lower the price cap, which is not being fully enforced, there would be a very limited result at best. So we need actually to double down on the enforcement of the price cap. That is not uh, not less important thing that that uh, at what uh, figure we actually set the price cap per barrel. Briefly, that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Vladimir. Thanks uh, very much. Uh, you mentioned exactly, you know, as almost an answer, covering some uh, other question on on chat. Of what's about nuclear? Really, we have we had. Uh, maybe a week ago, a uh, good uh, webinar uh, with Dixie Group on Rosatom. So just recently we put on my on my Twitter exactly a video recording of that seminar. So if somebody uh, wants to look, it's possible. Uh, now uh, I'm, I'm looking into other questions and please you know, I would ask speakers also to look into the chat. But one of the questions which is repeating and maybe, I don't know, Tom or, or, or somebody else can jump in. Uh, I see really very good uh, that we are getting more and more info about different reports and different papers uh, which were produced uh, as an answer to all the different questions. For example, Alina wrote what more can be done and she put exactly some link to uh, perhaps to another paper which we can read. Uh, but major questions are about, uh, you know, uh, I see another group of the questions, which is about what to do with those, you know, uh, circumvention of export uh, sanctions, especially on high tech, which really we know what is happening is that if, you know, EU, EU exports to Russia went down by more than 50%, but uh, EU uh, export to third countries like Kazakhstan, uh, I don't know, you know, also uh, Georgia maybe and some other increased exactly almost by the same number. So, and uh, Tom mentioned, and we had in here in the parliament, our meeting with uh, Ambassador Sullivan, uh, he really is doing a great job, but uh, maybe Tom, you can elaborate a little bit more what to do with those, you know, really now clear facts, what we see on the ground that, uh, a lot of trade now is going to some kind of those set countries, and we know who is the final beneficiary of those changes. Yeah, sure. Th thanks for asking. Uh, I should just say for for those who are um, uh, there's only so much I can do on my my iPhone. Um, the, do if you're interested in the whole nuclear story, do you have a look at the work of Daria Dolzakova from from Rusi, who um, who follows this very closely? But to to, to your uh, question, Andreas, I think. You know, I am um, the, the question I often ask uh, governments when I have the chance to to visit them, uh, and particularly trade ministries, is sort of how how much analysis have you done? How much analysis have you done of the the, the trade that your country is doing with Russia and with, with other countries? And then what are you doing with that information? Because you know, if you come across companies which, as you point out, suddenly their trade with Kazakhstan has gone up, it's double what it was last year. Well, why is that? I, sure as hell isn't because your marketing is fantastic and the Kazakhs are suddenly wanting to buy your products. Uh, it's almost certainly because of this circumvention issue. So I do think that we we need to look at our home base really quite closely and we need to be engaging with our industry uh, and frankly, making sure that industry is not profiting from this, this circumvention. So yes, of course, we need to engage with the, the um, the the, the the third countries we need to engage with industry in those countries but ultimately it's the products are coming from our countries uh, and so we need to stop those products from flowing 
uh, in increased amounts to places like Kazakhstan or Armenia or where, wherever, it, wherever it might be. I think that's the first thing I would say. I think the second thing I would say, of course, you know, the focus should be on trade, absolutely should be on, on, on trade. And, and I think we can have a debate as to what extent financial sanctions uh, have had the impact that we will hope. They're obviously the sanctions that people are most uh, familiar with. But I think that the next thing I would say is that, of course, there are banking institutions in all these countries that for supporting trade rely on their relationship with the big correspondent banks uh, in London, in Frankfurt, um, in Paris, wherever, wherever it might be. And I think you know, that's, again, another Achilles heel that we can we can go after. I mean, I remember, so I spent 20 years at JP Morgan. In my last year at JP Morgan, uh, I was one of the bankers who was involved in cutting off our dollar payment relationship with the banks in Latvia, with your neighbor, Andreas. Um, and boy, was that painful for Latvia. And that was the beginning of Latvia's journey to try and clean up its its financial system. I saw I saw the the the, the impact that that had. So I do think that we, we need to um, also focus on these financial channels, not so much from a kind of freezing assets perspective, but from making it clear that the the financing of this kind of trade is also um, unacceptable. And I should say as well that um, uh, we put these in our our recommendations, which I'll also uh, circulate uh, late, later on. So I think generally I'm arguing for a much more physical approach to this challenge now. You know, we need to um, uh, make it clear that uh, supporting evasion is not acceptable. We also, I think Maria mentioned, Russia has agency. Obviously, its tactics will change as we um, take different steps. The the phrase I think a lot of people say the phrase the word of the year is implementation. I actually think the word of the year is maintenance. We need to maintain the effectiveness of the sanctions packages. We were not uh, we did not maintain effectiveness after 2014. We let the Ukrainian people down. Um, we need to make sure that we maintain the effectiveness of the sanctions that we've that we've issued. The Americans, I must say, are very good at that. Um, we in Europe are, are not so good at that, tracking the target and continuing to apply pressure as the target changes um, its um, uh, its activities. I'll stop. Okay, thanks a lot, Tom. Uh, I see, yeah, I see some questions, very specific ones, and they come from uh, Gunther Ferliger. Again, on Rosatom, I just, you know, I will repeat that uh, we had a seminar webinar, but also that uh, as we are now in the council, there are proposals from at least several countries, including uh, Lithuania, Baltic States and Poland uh, to introduce sanctions on Rosatom. So that is going through discussion. I see Maria wants to jump in, then we shall go back to, to uh, some questions. Okay, Maria. Uh, thank you very much. And I, again, I concur with other participants. It's a very productive um, conversation, and I appreciate the specificity of it, as Vladimir has mentioned. Uh, a couple of more points on the implementation, uh, since that's something we also uh, looked at. Uh, first of all, uh, talking with the countries, even the countries close to Russia, works. Uh, it's important to understand that a lot of countries are in it for their own uh, material gains. It's really, this, uh, like, just imagine the scale that circum of uh, profits that circumventing the sanctions actually provides for uh, the lo local participants, right? It's really, it's really hard to um, hard not to take on this opportunity. Uh, the key uh, takeaway is, first of all, talking to countries work. We see that when uh, Western officials, representatives travel to countries like Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, uh, subsequently, there are usually some amendments introduced uh, and the sanctions, uh, sanctions uh, better enforced. Second point, unfortunately, as long as Russia has the money, it will figure it out. As Vladimir said, it will be more expensive and efficient. And of course, there will be an effect. So sanctions will continue working, but maybe not as effectively as we originally designed. So going after Russia's money is key. Once they run out of money, this is where the energy revenues are highly important. Uh, when they run out of money, it will become less lucrative for neighboring or uh, uh, active uh, other third parties to participate in the circumvention. Last but not the least, one issue which we ran into while working on our latest report on the, um, um, on the um, uh, specifically the effect of sanctions on defense is a lack of coordination uh, across the allies. 
Uh, one, uh, again, sanctions enforcement. I know this is maybe a cliche point, but creating some sort of a fact or some sort of coordinating agency at the EU level, or at least a think tank, maybe with a good funding, that will look at the uh, way uh, of what works and what does not, um, would be a really, a really a much needed um, and helpful effort to achieve a, a better implementation. Uh, to give you an example, there's absolutely no lack of information about Western components that are, that keep being dis discovered in uh, into the type of uh, Russian equipment then and that ends up in Ukraine. But if you want to find one place where you can identify, say, companies uh, whose components willingly or unwillingly ended up um, in those weapons, this is much harder. So creating this structure that would coordinate uh, this monitoring exceptions and compliance uh, would be really helpful. So far, it's, um, it's dispersed across the member states, and uh, we know we'll know that unfortunately that creates a lot of inefficiencies. So that's something to consider going forward, even if I do understand it will probably not going to be as easy as we'd hope. Thanks, Maria. Now. Uh... I will give the floor uh, to Elena, but before that, I don't know if somebody wants to answer the question which is coming from, as I said, from Gunther Ferligan from Austria, as I understand. And the question sounds like that. Our government would love to break the OMV gas gas from contract if you would help us to back us to break this 7 billion euro per year, take or pay and supply us with gas from non-Russia suppliers but uh, alone without your help, we will not do that for sure and continue to buy gas from Russia. So uh, uh, I don't know who is able to to answer such a uh, really specific question. Uh, on... may, may I jump on that? Yeah, OK. Uh, so I mm -hmm. think really, uh, the, uh, I believe that European uh, Union should offer at least some intellectual help for uh, negotiations help uh, to countries which are willing to get rid of the remaining supplies of Russian energy. So Austria was one of those. We see that it's doable, uh, but really more help like, you know, uh, Italian former Prime Minister Mario Draghi, after the beginning of invasion, he really went on a major tour uh, of African and other countries, uh, finding alternatives to Russian gas, and he was successful. Italy actually got rid of uh, dependence on Russian gas. Uh, maybe Austria is sort of under capacity in this regard, so it's need help. So I believe uh, help should be provided in this case. However, uh, if you look at the recent McFoley or Mac report, they actually argue that uh, Russian supplies, transit supplies of gas to Ukraine should be kept and should not be sanctioned. So we need to double. I personally disagree. But I understand that this is coming from Ukrainians. They want to keep the Russian transit flowing, which is also going to, to Austria, as I understand. So they should be consulted in this regard because there's this a little bit of a complexity. But OMV also has an equity stake in the Russian upstream in Western Siberia. They should exit that. And they should demonstrate specific steps that they want to really want to leave Russia. So far, they have been quite ambiguous. Okay, Vladimir. Now, Elena wanted to uh, speak about uh, what Ilya was speaking about, personal sanctions. Of course, our webinar uh, today is more on those you know, uh, sanctions for economy and, and finances. But nevertheless, I see also some additional, quite a long question about personal sanctions from Alex Gusev, which is asking really, you know, from us an answer to this quite uh, Hot debate, as we see also in Russian opposition, among uh, possibility to split elite, you know, with having some kind of, uh, how to say, modification of personal sanctions. So, Elena, can you can you also try to answer that part of the question? I was hoping to to pass that on to Ilya, to be honest, but uh, I will have the same question uh, to people who, because we, a lot of economists do speculate about personal sanctions and I have my personal views, but I'd rather pass on to the uh, experts here. I'll just uh, make a quick comment and I know we're focusing on, on Russia, uh, Russia sanctions. We should not forget and maybe that would be something for the next seminar. Uh, we should not forget about the reconstruction of Ukraine. 
because on one hand we're trying to undermine Russia's ability to wage the war. On the other hand, we cannot have a situation where we're leaving reconstruction for after some point X, a fat dot, the end of the conflict, which we might not get. And we might need to start thinking on the other side, not just the military support, but the reconstruction support for Ukraine. So I'll, I'll stop here and I'll pass the question actually uh, to Ilya. Yeah, Ilya, can you answer mm -hmm. this you know, on personal sanctions and what they call in a polite way modification of them? Right. So I think this is a really important question. And uh, Tom uh, indicated there needs to be a theory of change behind specific sanctions. And the theory of change behind personal sanctions is very clear, in fact. And I'm a political scientist by training. Uh, I understand how this could possibly work. Uh, there could be uh, elite defections because of this increased uh, pressure. And uh, uh, in light of this, this very clear mechanism, uh, it's not really obvious why this instrument of personal sanctions is not employed um, on a wider scale. Because, uh, you know, some uh, luxury magazines uh, about uh, luxury European real estate and uh, some attractions for, for the oligarchs and for the richest men in Russia, they are still published. So uh, that means that uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of uh, corrupt uh, public officials and oligarchs from Russia are still traveling to Europe, enjoying, uh, enjoying uh, uh, those uh, luxury resorts, uh, still maintain their real estate, maintain their uh, luxury lifestyle, and uh, not enough is done to, to counter that because uh, mm, this, uh, this is a very specific point of pressure that can produce uh, real results. So, uh, and, and uh, politically, and in terms of economic trade-offs, uh, I think that personal sanctions are actually uh, easier, they're supposed to be easier to implement than uh, sectoral sanctions, but still uh, we do not see uh, such vigorous activity uh, in this sphere. So that uh, this is an important issue. And uh, regarding the exit strategies, uh, it's true. I think that there needs to be some kind of mechanism, uh, more or less horrible mechanism, to uh, allow people to uh, remove sanctions from themselves. And uh, this should involve uh, basically political opposition to uh, Putin's regime, the expression of uh, their opposition to the war and to Putin's regime, and maybe a contribution of part of their wealth to you know these activities opposition activities so uh, there is uh, there is some work to do in this regard and i think this could be effective so uh, may i also jump, jump in anders for yeah, a second yeah. this this okay. is hugely important and i'm sorry that i was concentrating mostly on economic sanctions but personal sanctions are indeed lagging behind and we see this strange situation with the new packages of eu sanctions we have like Two more people added on the list, 10 more people. That's nothing. We really need tens of thousands to be added, and which is Ukrainian government's list of personal sanctions is the closest thing to what uh, should be done. And uh, only through this, we will really send a message to the second, third layer people in the Russian government that none of you will be forgotten. Because right now, they all are contributing to Putin's system, hoping that they can pass underneath the radar. We should need to double down on this. And I don't know, maybe we need to do a questionnaire in Brussels, why people are so hesitant to including more and more names on the list of the personal sanctions. Maybe they are afraid of overwhelmingly difficult administration of the sanctions, I don't know. But uh, this is really an issue that is uh, puzzling me. And uh, on the exit, I think it's premature to raise the very question of exit from sanctions. Let, they have been, all these people, they have been enablers of uh, Putin's system for far too long. They need to do something first to demonstrate the goodwill and that they're acting in good faith. Only then we can uh, sit down and talk, and talk with them. Before they did not do anything, it should be out of question, all this discussion on lifting the sanctions and so on. Yes, Vladimir, I think that, uh, you know, uh, this is a very important topic and maybe we shall come, you know, uh, with our next uh, webinar exactly on the personal sanctions issue. 
and the EU policy and, and, and so on. As maybe some of you know, we shall have quite a large conference at the beginning of June here in Brussels, you know, where one of the topics will be exactly, you know, uh, also the same sanctions policy, including personal one. And Tom was raising his hand. Uh, still you are raising? Or you? I, I was just going to say one small thing on yeah. personal sanctions. Um, uh, certainly in the UK, when this started, um, it was an opportunity to catch up with doing work that should have been done over many years. Um, i.e. targeting individuals who had moved money to London grad and felt impunity with their money there. And so the initial wave of sanctions in the UK felt more about getting people that the government should have dealt with over many years than necessarily uh, responding to the uh, Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. Of course, now we have different types of individuals who are sanctioned. So Vladimir talked about you know, perhaps the names that aren't the trophy names, but, um, and I wouldn't disagree with, with any of that. The last thing I would say is that, of course, many people are spending a lot of time on this so-called freeze and seize, freeze to seize debate. Um, and I said, gosh, six, eight months ago, you know what, we should consider seeing if any of these people want to buy themselves off these lists. And I know it's distasteful, but I was really pleased to hear Ilya say it as well. You know, some of these individuals, um, you know, are, are willing to buy themselves off, off the list. I'm not saying that's the only way you should be allowed off the list. There are other things you would need to do as well. But I do think that we might want to think about that because you can earn a lot of money that way, um, a lot more money than you will spending all this time trying to jump from an administrative track of sanctions to a, a criminal track of, of confiscation. It's controversial, but I do think we're going to start seeing people um, considering that, um, notwithstanding Vladimir's point about it being too early for, for exit. So I would encourage thinking about that. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, our time is uh, over. So uh, really it was very interesting and very dynamic webinar with a lot of you know uh, information, which I am very grateful. It will be very, very, very of a very great value in, uh, at least for us you know, in preparing uh, some of uh, uh, resolutions. So, whatever we shall decide to do in the parliament. Uh, thanks a lot to all the speakers. Thanks a lot for really very important links to important uh, papers or studies. And that is, uh, again, value of our webinars. Uh, definitely, you know, we shall continue our webinars on, on sanctions issue and maybe next one will be more concentrated on uh, personal sanctions. And for time being, I will conclude here again uh, with a lot of thanks to everybody, all the participants and and speakers. And you know, I would like to wish everybody you know good luck and Tom, you know, good continuation of your of your bicycle tour. <laughs> so, <laughs> great. Okay. Thanks a lot to everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.